Hi, Jeff Bridgman here of Jeff R. Bridgman American Antiques in York County, Pennsylvania. I've come here tonight to tell you about one of the most rare American flags that I have ever offered for sale. Now, think about early devices on American flags other than stars or stripes. What's the most popular? Without any question, the most popular, the most widely recognized early American flag from the 18th century that's not the national flag has what? A rattlesnake. I just get tons of requests. I can almost not even count them for what's called don't tread on me flags most often by those asking. And every time I get one of those requests, I have the same reaction internally, if not externally. I try to hold back, but my disappointment sometimes gets ahead of me. Why? Because that is not something that we reproduced in early America. We continued to make 13 star flags from the very beginning till, well, we still make them today. But rattlesnake based flags, of which there were a whole bunch of different styles, were not really reproduced until the 20th century. Not only 20th century, but 1976. Not the 1920s, not the 1940s. You can see some at that time, but uh, you know, these are 20th century, um, mostly mass produced examples and not interesting to most flag collectors in the way that 19th century examples and unique early things are. So for all practical purposes, examples don't exist from the 18th century or the 19th century, with just a couple of exceptions. And in the 18th century, there's only three, none of which is one of the popular designs that you would think of immediately today. Unless you now, know. it was American forefather John Jay of New York, truly important American guy at the time, right? Who suggested that it had been Christopher Gadsden that first suggested the use of a rattlesnake and a don't tread on me slogan for a flag to represent the United States Navy. Who was Gadsden? Well, he was also a very important early American forefather, not as much of a household name, though he probably should be. Um, and he was really the nucleus of American liberty and the seeking of independence from the state of South Carolina. He was the um, delegate from that state to the Second Continental Congress. And he served on something that was called the Marine Committee. So if you're a flag geek, you're gonna recognize that name right away as being one and the same, the Congressional Subcommittee with oversight of the Navy. That in 1777, on June 14th, Flag Day, was the one that presented the design of the Stars and Stripes to Congress uh, upon which it was approved as the American national flag. So Gadsden served as that committee's first chairman. He did so for only about a month from December of 1775 until January of 1776. Then he got called back to South Carolina uh, to serve pressing matters in that particular state. And so he left. And when he got there, however, on February 8th of that year, Gadsden, when he returned, presented Congress with a flag that looked like this. According to John Drayton, who twice served as governor of that state, in a book called Memoirs of the American Revolution, he records that he presented the South Carolina Provincial Congress with an elegant standard such as to be used by the commander in chief of the United States Navy. A yellow flag with a lively representation of a rattlesnake 
poised as if preparing to strike, and the words, don't tread on me, below. So the South Carolina Provincial Congress uh, agreed to accept the flag and happily did so, and said that it should be preserved and suspended in the Congressional Hall, uh, where it remained as such to the left of the president's chair for many years to come. Now, what happened to it? Great question. Doesn't survive today. Neither does any other 18th or um, opening of the 19th century flag in that pattern. Nothing in the colonial period or in the federal period that followed, which we kind of say ends in the, in the 1820s. So what does survive? Well, the earliest of three known flags with rattlesnakes. And remember, Rev War battle flags are just incredibly rare. Almost nothing exists to begin with, just a tiny handful. But there are three um, thought to date to that period with rattlesnakes as devices. None of them is in the pattern of the Gadsden flag or the uh, First Navy Jack, which is a red and white striped flag with uh, the rattlesnake going across it, thought to also have been used by um, the first Commodore of the United States Navy thereafter. So, uh, you know, another very popular design and uh, quite frankly, not well, not as recognizable as the Gadsden flag, a close second. So the earliest of the known surviving examples is a flag of something called the 5th Pennsylvania Independent Battalion, also known as the Westmoreland Battalion or Proctor's Brigade. This is a red flag with a completely red field and up serving as its canton, the British Union flag. That appears on other early American flags from the beginning of the war, especially. And in the center is a rattlesnake, um, above which are initials that represent the unit, and below a scrolling banner that says, don't tread on me. That flag is in the William Penn Memorial Museum in Harrisburg, which honestly, I live in Harrisburg, and I've never heard that name. And it's what we know here as the State Museum. Yet another flag that exists from the period was just recently discovered. That flag is being displayed right now in the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. And it will be there from this year until next. That is a tremendous museum not to be missed. Only about a block and a half from Independence Hall and on the same side of the street. This flag, once again, recently discovered, it's amazing that there's still things like this to be found out there, is a flag of the 2nd Spartan Regiment of South Carolina Militia. Blue in color, it has a canton that consists of 13 stripes assembled from gold gilt lines set an alternate position against the blue ground itself. And there's a central device on this flag that features both a Spartan dog, amazing, and a rattlesnake. The flag was made for a unit that was raised in 1778 by the state's provincial Congress, same one, that was tasked with the defense of its residents. Also, while you're there, be sure not to miss the presentation of, of Washington's battle tent. Not just a movie or something like that. The actual tent that he commanded from. Just amazing. If that doesn't give you chills while you watch it, then you just don't like American history at all. And I don't know what in the world they're doing watching this video to begin with. <laughs> Anyways, also while you're there, be sure to see a presentation of 
very early American kerchiefs orchestrated by Jeff R. Bridgman Antiques with uh, the museum's uh, um, request. And uh, you know, some of them are ours, some of them belong to friends of mine. Um, amazing, amazing thing to see. So the third flag is thought to have been carried by a Rhode Island unit that was involved in something called the United Company of the Train of the Artillery of 1775. Um, mouthful, right? What was that? Well, that was a conglomeration of men led by Rev War General Henry Knox, who Washington tasked with going to Fort Ticonderoga and getting cannon there that were captured by Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen and transporting them back to Boston 300 miles uh, in the winter of 1775 and 70, 1776 to be used in the defense of the city. Knox did that by transporting them on sleds Man, we think we're tough today. Let me tell you. At any rate, at, he was, they were successful, by the way, in doing just that. But um, this unit was supposedly part of that. This was a gold flag, with or yellow, with 13 blue stars over top of a rattlesnake, above a banner that reads, Don't Tread on Me. It's a coiled snake. And below are a pair of cannons and an anchor. The thing that makes the flag controversial is the signature on the anchor belonging to a guy named John Penniman. John Riddo Penniman was born in either 1782 or 1783, the latter being the year that the Red War ended. So obviously he didn't paint this flag for the Revolutionary War. He was, however, a known maker of flags. In fact, he made one for the city of Boston in 1822. He died in 1830. Um, so now he's a known painter and engraver and flag maker. Did he repair the flag? Did he uh, make a reproduction of the flag? It's hard to know. But at any rate, it's still a great example to study and throw in this mix because it is, even if not 18th century, an early flag with a don't tread on me statement and a coiled rattlesnake. So there's three. So what about post-federal era flags? There's only three there. Um, what exists afterwards? Well, as it turns out, not too many. I saw a flag years ago while doing uh, an appraisal in Wilton, Connecticut at an outdoor show. This is a you know, better part of 20 years ago, probably, um, that was part of an array of historic flags, homemade, that may have dated as early as 1876, was more likely to have dated to the 1890s, 1900, 1910, World War I, uh, probably a little earlier than that. Um, I would love to see the flag again. This has been so many years ago, but it's never turned up since, and I lost the owner's information. Horrible thing to have happened. At any rate, that is a potential early one, though maybe not 19th century. However, there is an example that I really hope that existed that was present on an engraving in a book called Frank Leslie's, he was a great publisher by the way in New York, Historical Register of the Centennial Exposition. This was a monster coffee table like book, we didn't have coffee tables in the 19th century but it doesn't matter, um, you get the picture. Uh, a tremendous book that he did in that is an engraving by a guy named, I think, Frank Miranda, who did this wonderful picture 
of a huge array of flags, 75 feet in the air. And the flags are individually like, I don't know, 12 feet at the smallest, but probably 15 or even closer to 20 feet in length. So there's the Stars and Stripes, there's a Grand Union, um, there's Rev War examples and all sorts of different uh, varieties thought to have been carried. And they all center around a large oval painting of a woodsman. And above that was to be the Gadsden flag. Well, I always presumed it was there. Didn't have any reason to believe it wasn't there. I presume that the artist was looking at the exhibit when he produced the engraving. But Miranda evidently wasn't. Or something changed about the exhibit because we discovered an actual photograph of that display. And in it, there is no Gadsden flag. There is, in fact, a black rectangular hole where it's supposed to go with other flags kind of overlapping it a little bit and to be the center point of the entire exhibit. But in the photograph, it's not there. Whoa, okay. Also, the artist definitely embellished the engraving because not only that, the oval painting is different. It does show a pioneer woodsman but there are numerous differences. With the fair going on for six months and with major events every day, was the flag taken down to be used somewhere else or was it maybe just not there yet and was slated to be there and the painting wasn't finished because they're gonna send somebody up 75 feet in the air to do so? I mean, I don't know, it's really impossible to say. The things they did for that fair were, it wasn't exactly building the pyramids, but if you've seen the stuff produced that was displayed in all the exhibits, the quantity of incredible stuff, just in a, you know, 20 foot by 20 foot section was incredible. And this, there were 200 and some buildings beyond nuts. If I could do one thing, if I could go back in time and go to one place, I would select the Centennial Exposition and I'd go spend a week there of my, it, it is absolutely beyond incredible. Is it feasible that they took the flag down from 75 feet up or roughly thereabouts because there were a couple flags over top of it to use somewhere else? Yes. Uh, do we know it was actually there? No. We've searched high and low and can't find another photograph of that particular spot. Which makes sense. I mean, photography was tough at that time. It took a while to get a photograph. To, it's not like person after person came by and took a snapshot. It wasn't like that. So this was taken by the Centennial F Photographic Company and they were the primary ones that photographed the fair. There were others, and maybe there's something out there that we'll find at some point, but we haven't yet. Amazing just to find that one. Now, what else exists from the 19th century? There are a couple of banners with, with coiled snakes, but in the actual Gadsden flag, this is one of two known examples that are definitely the earliest among them. Printed on glazed sulfur yellow cotton chintz. If I didn't know more about this flag now than I did at the time I first saw it, I would say for sure it's 1830s or 40s. Could be 20s or 50s, but 1830s or 40s thing. The graphics, the fabric, everything about it is very much that period. Now, the, the fabric, this glazed yellow chintz, chintz fabric, when you see it in a quilt, that's when you expect to find it, and especially in this color. During the Civil War period, eh, not likely. So, 
you know, and when we say chintz, you have to remember that chintz gets used for a couple of different things. Some textile people will use that term for a printed calico-like, um, usually floral print fabric uh, the, of the early 19th century, first half to the mid 19th century. And uh, then we'll also use it throughout the 19th century for glazed fabrics like this, glazed solid fabrics. So just be aware of that when you hear that term. Now, the other example like this one was for a long time in the collection of a guy named J. Doyle DeWitt, uh, who gifted it to the University of Hartford. He was an insurance guy at an insurance company in Hartford and gifted it to the university, uh, where it was managed by a guy named Edmund Sullivan. Sullivan wrote a book called Collecting Political Americana, and it's pictured in there in color. Previous to that, it was pictured in another book by the Smithsonian, um, done by Herbert Ridgway Collins, curator of political history, and it's pictured in there in black and white. Both Collins and Sullivan date that particular flag to 1864, and both say, and Collins is kind of known to, you know, he went around America, he looked at uh, collections in various places, and he gathered everything that he could get together and made this monstrous 566 page book with um, 1500 objects in it. There's numerous mistakes, but what he did was an incredible piece of work and he was the first guy to do it. So that's what you're gonna have when you try to put that many things together and you really have no way without years and years and years of work to analyze and double analyze and double check and have conferences on every single object. So it just is what it is. And Threads of History, for example, it lists the snake as being red and the text as being black. Um, you know, that obviously isn't the case. And then the flag uh, belong, uh, belonging to this collection was pictured in color by Sullivan, so we know the colors are the same. Now, another uh, uh, problem is that both guys date the flag to 1864, stating that it was used by the Copperheads. The Copperheads were a faction uh, in Civil War America who were Democrats, in other words, approving of slavery at the time, but yet they were anti-war. So that's what the Copperheads were, if you've ever heard of that faction. They were uh, anti-war Democrats. The problem with all of that is that this is not a Copperhead. And they are suggesting, both Sullivan and um, Collins, that this is a Copperhead. No, it is obviously not. It's obviously a rattlesnake. It has 13 rattles. It's a great early American image. Um, you know, a known thing, a known American object. I didn't know Collins, but I have a good friend who knew Sullivan, and said Sullivan was an extremely bright guy, and I'm sure he just had a bad day. Uh, you know, he probably needed to just that day pull his hat down and, uh, you know, and just accept defeat. Um, and this happens. I make mistakes all the time. We all do. I don't want to, you know, poke too much fun at these guys but they miss just an obvious thing, that's, that's all. But the graphics of this are very much like 1830s and 40s, what you see in political Americana at that time. You know, things made for the cold water army, uh, anti-alcohol, temperance, um, early political candidates in the 1840s and maybe 50s. Um, could it be Civil War? Sure. So, you know, it could be. These are nearly identical flags, and the earliest thing that actually exists in the Gadsden design. So where did they hail from? What were they made for? Well, clues are present 
and a couple of other flags that are known to exist, one of which I owned, and others we found uh, during our research. Here's one. There are three surviving flags made in 1860, we think, uh, to support South Carolina secession. This is one of them. It's a glazed cotton white flag with a palmetto tree in the center and a rattlesnake curling up it. And off to the side, a single star and a banner that reads Southern rights at all hazards. This particular flag came with a photograph of a soldier attached to it, a Union soldier, who accompanied Sherman on his march to the sea. The flag was supposedly picked up at a barn in Columbia, South Carolina, the capital, on the guy's way home with Sherman still now. There's another flag like it, also printed on white, but with the fabric not appearing to have been glazed, although that's, it's hard to tell with absolute certainty, but it doesn't appear to be glazed, printed in a medium dark green. So interesting. You'll see this a lot in early textiles where they make two things very much alike, but slightly different. The star, it is thought, might associate the flags with the Citadel, an important military institution in Charleston. Now, a third flag in a closely related style features a different palmetto tree without the star and without the rattlesnake. And with a different form of scrolling ribbon that passes laterally behind the tree, that flag also contains the same text in the same block font, closer to square in shape than the rectangular flags I just showed you. This one is really interesting and ties the other together because it's printed in both black and green on a white ground. In this case, the white is glazed and the text and the scrolling banner are black and where they hit the center of the tree, the tree turns black. So everything else is green and just that banner rolling through the tree is black, obviously closely related with some notes written on it that document it was obtained by a guy named Charlie Herbst, a member of the 2nd Kentucky Infantry, who reported it as having been printed in New York as one of a dozen in January of 1861. Now the kicker. We found an article when researching the Gadsden flags and these others I just spoke of and trying to tie things together. We found an article in the Charleston Daily Courier dated December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day, <laughs> um, 1860. And in it, it described a flag in the first style I mentioned like the one picked up on Sherman's March, or just after. So having the snake going up the tree that was presented by a guy named John Easterly to Augustus Longstreet, who was president of the University of South Carolina, just two weeks before the state seceded from the Union. It had a green snake and the lettering in gold. Now, this gold, gold gilt, it's hard to tell. Lettering is more often gilded than just uh, printed in yellow, that is, but he was obviously using sulfur yellow and it's not like he couldn't, so eh, it's hard to say, um, but it, here we're tying everything together because it's got the green that appears in the other flags as, 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 as one of its type and one of the other type. 
And now here's another one with both green and gold. So John Easterby of New York and Charleston. This was a guy working in New York from approximately 1850 to 1860 when he heard that South Carolina was going to secede and rumors were such that that was at the point of happening, he packed up his stuff in New York, came to Charleston and set up shop there and got ready uh, to go to war for his home state. Now, he had served as a color sergeant, believe it or not, and a South Carolina militia unit, one of about a hundred that existed during the antebellum. And listen to this. It also reports the flag to be smooth and glossy, exhibiting great skill in the art of printing upon cloth. Amazing. So glazed once again. I mean, a lot of times parade flags were glazed but the manner in which these are done is of an earlier ilk. So very likely, even though these flags look earlier, and even though there are other times at which they could potentially have been relevant, they could have been made for the 1824 uh, return of Lafayette, uh, they could have been made for the 1826 50th anniversary of independence, they could, with a Gadsden relationship like this, have been made for something called the nullification crisis, in which federal taxes were imposed on South Carolina and other states. But, I mean, there were trade-related uh, taxing goods both on the way in and on the way out, crippling to the state's economy, which was based largely on trade, with Charleston as a, as a port town, that was such an issue that uh, the state almost went to war with the federal government. In fact, it went so far as to muster troops for exactly that. This was the first time that South Carolina came very close to seceding from the Union. And obviously long, 28 years before 1860, um, when it finally did. You know, the don't tread on me, there's echoes of the Stamp Act at the time. Taxation without proper representation in a way, right? And here was the same kind of situation going on with South Carolina in 1832. So it would have been very apropos to have that flag used in South Carolina at the time. But the fact of the matter is that this flag is very much like others that we know to have been made by Easterby. And I think all roads lead back to that. I would say almost with certainty that this was produced by Easterby, probably in New York, just before he came back to Charleston uh, to greet his uh, new friends and potential friends and potential allies and show his support for the state in the face of secession. Whatever the case may be, we can't be completely sure, but whatever the case may be, this is one of just two flags that I know of for certain to date to the 19th century and be in the form of what is almost certainly the second most recognizable flag in America next to the Stars and Stripes. What an incredible opportunity for somebody to be able to personally own one of the two earliest known examples and the only two that I know to date to the 19th century of this extraordinary flag. So thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon.